<laughs> okay, well, good morning. Welcome to our Open Education Resources webinar. Um, we're going to talk today about what it takes to create and publish open education resources, basically. Um, this webinar is hosted through Academic Innovations and E-Learning, and we'll do some introductions of our two facilitators today in just a sec. So real quick, our agenda will be introductions. We're going to uh, say hi and do kind of a round robin of why we're here, and then talk specifically a quick review of what open educational resources are and what um, the what, why, and how uh, overview, and a little blurb, blurb, blurb on universal design. And then uh, the second half is, I've created it, now what? And so we've got some really great information um, about how and where to publish open educational resources here at UAA through systems that we have set up. And then we'll have a nice time at the end for some Q&A and discussion about maybe projects or ideas that um, you may have about open ed resources in your area or your content area. So I'm going to start with introductions. Um, I'll start with me because I'm online and then we'll uh, go to Eric and Claire who are in right now. But um, I'm Laura Madden, an instructional designer um, and the professional development coordinator uh, here at um, Academic Innovations and E-Learning. And I'm super interested in open ed resources both for um, assisting faculty in thought process of adding open ed resources to their course design, and also um, in my own teaching, because I do teach a freshman level course that has a very specific um, book and online lab thing that uh, I find actually very unaccessible for my students, um, even f from financial to um, technical. And it makes it very difficult for a large number of my students to even participate in the course. And so um, I just am I'm really excited about open ed resources and how we can bring these ideas and um, processes to UAA. So I'll go to you, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Carlson, an assistant professor of library science here at the Consortium Library. Um, my biggest hat that I wear is I run uh, ScholarWorks at UAA, uh, uh, our institutional repository which is an open access uh, digital server that pipes great things that we make here at uh, UAA and actually UAS and UAS out to the world. And um, this is going to be really useful to all of you making open educational resources uh, going forward. Claire, and you want a quick intro? Um, sure. Um, my name is Claire Dannenberg, and I am an assistant professor here in the English and Anthropology departments, and I'm a linguistic anthropologist. Um, I'm interested in finding out more uh, about um, the open resources simply because, um, well, in terms of my teaching research and outreach. I mean, I think I would like to consider uh, certainly um, helpful to have more resources available to my students, but also um, for myself to um, do some publishing um, and broaden my audience and have a broader impact, um, certainly to, um, you know, have uh, the chance to spread my materials to um, folks who um, may not have an opportunity to come to the university. Oh, that's great, Claire. Hey, Darlene, um, we're just coming down the list to say a quick introduction of like why, why we're here and who we are at the university um, and why we're interested in OER resources, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, thank you. I apologize. My phone just started ringing. I'm just going to hit I divert. <laughs> there we go. Okay, um, so I'm Darlene Gill. I'm with the Bachelor of Science uh, Technology Program. Uh, my interest in, us, in educational resources um, is to provide students with a, an alternative to uh, expensive textbooks um, and allow us, um, well, I'm the only faculty member, but allow uh, us, me and our adjuncts, to develop the material that is appropriate for our students. Um, and so, I found something for our spring class, um, and I'm I'm curious how um, I'm supposed to interpret the um, Creative Commons licensing. 
So that's that's what I was hoping to gain today. Awesome. That's actually really good. I do we do have um, a slide and we'll talk about um, the Creative Commons licensing um, real specifically in two parts. I'm going to cover kind of the front end of it and then Eric's going to talk about choosing uh, licensing um, through the ScholarWorks program. So that is perfect and great. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. So I will, let's see, move on through our agenda real quick. So I'm going to talk about these first pieces. Um, open Ed Resources, the real quick definition that most of us know if we've been kind of in any of the workshops in the last couple of weeks is basically any kind of teaching material, textbooks, syllabi, lesson plans, videos, readings, assessments um, that are shared. And so it's teaching material, so educational resources, right? And the open part is free access. Um, the free and the CC Creative Commons copyright permissions um, attached to those teaching materials and then shared out um, is what makes something an open educational resource, right? We as the publisher, or if we look online, um, in all of these places that of the picture here that people have published Creative Commons licensed work, they're sharing that out for us um, around the world uh, um, to share and to reuse and revise and, and share with our students so that we have just this open and free access. You know, and the why do it, we'll talk about a little bit. They've got a couple of things there. And then are you in? If you're here, you're probably really interested and, you know, for all the great reasons. And then we're going to talk about some other resources or I'll show you some other resources at the very end. So the OER resources are, that are out there are amazing, though they're a little bit disjointed. And so part of um, the workshop earlier in the, the month was about finding OER resources and content for your course. And um, I can share that out so that we can kind of think as publishers how we not only license our works, where we put them, and why it's important where we put them and how we share them. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. So basically, I talked about the access, right, the free and open access. And it means really clearly that if we as publishers share out our material with a Creative Commons license, open ed resources follow the five R's, um, you, we put it out there. It's on the internet for anyone to find, Google, grab from the internet. And that's the retain piece. I find it. I think, man, this is amazing. I can use this for my teaching, I can share this with my students, it's valuable, I can pull that off the internet and hold a copy with, um, without paying someone because someone gave it to me for free, right, and I can retain it. Then I can reuse it. I can use it in any way that I want because it's CC licensed and I'm in a, in a way that I'm understanding how to reuse that material um, and it's been given to me freely. I can revise it based on um, open ed uh, resources licensing. I can I could even change it so I can retain something, I can use it in any way I want, but I also have the ability to revise. So if I am an expert I, in an area and I go, this is really great for my class, but it's missing something that's really, that I've done some research on and, and the, or that's new in the field and I want to add a chapter um, or a revise, revise parts of this, I can, I can do that because the copyright for Creative Commons copyright lets me do that. And then I can also remix. So I can take one, two, or two or three, or even more uh, open ed resource materials and pull them together. So say MIT's got some curriculum in my content area, and I really love modules one, seven, and eight. I'm like, oh, these are great. And then um, I find something from Course or OpenStax, which is another site where there's a book. and their open book has um, some other chapter and content, and I want to merge those together and remix them and make modules for my students in a way that I teach my material. And in that, I can even add my own research chapter, um, you know, about the current comment or current research. So that's really exciting. It gives you all that academic freedom of just like pulling those really important pieces together, the stuff that made your content and your, you know, gave you the passion for, to teach your content in the first place, right? Being able to pull it all together. And then in the community of open ed resources, we like to redistribute that. So I can, if I, when I go through all this process, if I'm revising and remixing this OER, the community says, hey, show us what you've done. 
redistribute it, post it out somewhere um, in a format that other people can find and I can find too and we can um, share that, that educational content in, in another way. And so I think that's really exciting. It gives us kind of this new way of thinking about what we're creating from our research and our teaching and what we're publishing. And, and so this actually doesn't always mean that you as faculty, we as faculty, Think, thinking about OER, thinking, oh, I have to create a whole new project to create open education resources. Actually, what you might be researching right now and looking into doing right now to share with your students, that's you can publish that any way you want, unless you've got some kind of co uh, contract with a publisher. You might need to do some negotiation there. But if you're creating something, you get the copyright um, that you choose. You get to choose the different copyright levels. So I think that's really exciting. Let's see. So we were going to talk about the why. Um, there's a lot of words on this thing here, but I think we're all in the know about this one. Copyright, you know, it limits. It limits and it, it's costly. We've heard that from Darlene mentioned, uh, you know, our students um, in her department have a cost, have costly books. Mine do too. I have a very costly book. It's not the worst book that I've ever seen, but it's, um, literally cost prohibitive for students to take my course. And and I, that actually breaks my heart. And so it, it makes it harder. In fact, I had two students this week say, I just got my money for my access codes. Now can I make it up? And that we're three modules in. You know, it's midterms time. And so that's just um, heartbreaking to see. And if my materials were open ed and they were created and, and in the course from day one, that that limit that is no longer limited. You know, they, they have it, and I've I've given it to them um, through through open educational resources. So, I think uh, we're it's really really important to not just think about the economic piece, but about the the timing and access. Um, and they all kind of merge together sometimes, but we we really know that this is really important to our students, especially this time of limited um, resources. We're talking about. Um, even the government, our federal government said, oh, we're going to give more money to students to take college courses, but it, there's still requirements that students have to have to, to you know, access that money. So it's, there's still a limit um, to that for them. And is there any questions about any of this so far? I'm talking kind of quick because I'm excited. <laughs> So we give the, the big smiley face. We're all in. We understand the why, um, and that's that's what gives us the passion for going into the project um, and and reevaluating our projects and publishing uh, styles here. So I have things beeping at me here. Okay. So then, because I want to give um, Eric a lot of time to talk about the repository. Here is where I can um, go over the licensing themselves. Themselves. So basically, creativecommons.org has made choosing a license as easy as absolutely possible. And that is amazing. Um, they have allowed us to use their Creative Commons licensing, by the way, for free, we don't have to pay anything, from their website, and they give us all these choices. And all of these choices are backed by, um, what do you call it, Cable Green said, rooms full of attorneys who write up the licensing and look at the licensing on a regular basis to update and to make sure that all of the verbiage is there and clear for the community. So they just do this. and they. They do it so that, because they have a passion, right, to share um, to, and allow all of us as publishers and creators of educational materials to share them. So the top one is public domain, so the big zero. Um, the public domain story is, you know, it lives, it's out there, uh, but according to copyright law, the federal copyright with the big C, one C, um, says that works don't go in the public domain until after someone dies. 70 years after someone dies, and um, now I think he said that um, 
yeah, Campbell Green said that they're trying to actually up that to 90 years after someone dies that the copyright can, their materials can go into the public domain. Um, but they have a public domain license. So if you really wanted to put all of your stuff that you ever publish and create into the public domain, you can actually license it that way through the Creative Commons. It's, it's, there it is free. Um, then the next one down is CC BY, second most open. Um, basically, it's saying, you can use this. You can do anything you want with it. You can do all the five R's, reuse, revise, remix, um, and please um, come back around and redistribute it so that others can share it. But please give me some um, attribution. Um, tell us, tell everyone where you got the original from so that they can go back to the original if they're interested and see it and use it and, you know, just just share everywhere, right? So CC BY is the most open, but please give us attribution. Public domain, you don't necessarily have anything about attribution, though it's always nice to tell people where you cite your work, right? Tell people where you got your things. But CC BY specifically is use it any way you want, but please tell everybody where you got it. <laughs> um, the next one, attribution and share alike. So BY SA. This one is attribution, that's the BY. And SA is please share back and share back around. Um, so if you change anything, if you share it out, um, make sure you're make, sharing it back out if you've done any remix, revision, or um, is it the two? You've already reused it. Revision or remix of the documents, of the chapters, please share that back out. Um, and it's we're kind of asking you by saying share alike that you would do that automatically. Um, those are the most, two, the, the second, that's the next level of open. It's open, but we really want to encourage you to share so that um, our audience is widened. We can put it out on the internet and more people um, might see that information and, and come back to it and be able to use it. Let's see. The next one is down below is um, buy and non-commercial. This sort of um, may have an effect for academic materials like we have through higher ed um, because we want to, as a publisher, say, just tell everyone where you got it, but please don't try to sell it to someone. Um, I've seen a couple of people say, oh, that means that if I find something that's attribution and non-commercial I want to use in my class, we have our tuition based. But technically it's not that way because we're not selling the book to the students. We're using it within our course content. And so non-commercial um, is OK there because we're not selling the book. And if you were charging students for printing it and charging them for the book, that might become fishy. But if you're giving them electronic documents and they can print it themselves, that doesn't, that doesn't um, negate the use of, of a non-commercial work. The last one on the green arrow list is by um, non-commercial and share alike. So it kind of adds that note that says, you know, please don't try to sell it <laughs> while you're giving me attribution for where you got it from and who first, who was the original creator. And then please, please remember to share it if, when you've um, revised and remixed it a little bit. So it's just different levels that you can choose for your own work. Um, and also, if you're ever looking for other works, maybe to, you know, remix into your work what those look like. Do you have some, do you have any questions, Darlene, about those? Or do you want to talk about um, what your project is and, and what you might choose? Yes, I do. Um, so what happened was uh, I was looking for a cheaper book for one of our classes um, and one that, that I could edit, um, you know, remove the content. So I stumbled across Flat World and they had a textbook um, that had some relevant content but not, uh, but then they had some really strange exercises and things like that in it. So I thought, yeah, it's great. Um, I can, I can edit this and it's only $49 for the students. Um, and I can share it with you if you don't mind. Absolutely. That would actually be a good example. Okay, so let me get it open here. So anyway, so uh, um, after attending the Cable Green uh, presentation, I um, went to sailor.org and found 
a textbook exactly like the one that, um, that I was going to use from Flat World. <clears throat> so I, um, I compared it and, okay, so here it is. So I compared it. And that's the wrong one. There it is. Okay. Um, and it had pretty much the same content. So is everybody seeing this? Yeah, I can see it now. It took yeah. a minute. <laughs> so it came with the, uh, of course, the Creative Commons, uh, and it is the, the by NC and SA. Um, and so then, I go back to the original author or, or the original creator of this book, this textbook, um, who had a website and said that um, he was given access to this before it was published by um, Flat World. So it's all, it's in a Word document and it's going to require some some decent editing um, because the formatting is really messed up. And we are going to change out some content. Um, so my question is, I understand that uh, I understand the licensing, but um, when should it be redistributed? Um, because it's kind of always going to be a work in progress in my mind. I, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? OK. This is a great <laughs> example. Um, I'll, let me say what I think, and then if Eric, if you have something um, to chime in. But this is what I see. So I see that it's Creative Commons by non-commercial and share alike. OK, so that's perfect. So you said um, we're looking at editing this. It's in a Word document, which means you technically, it won't cost students anything unless they print it out. Because once you edit, remix, and revise, you can give them a um, electronic document. Right. As a faculty, I would probably actually make it a PDF document for them, <laughs> but and not the original word, but just for editing purposes for the student end. But to reshare, um, once you have done all your editing for this first round, and you say, okay, this is the one I'm going to use for spring semester, um, and you're going to use it with your students, you can either share it at that time with your um, share alike uh, information on like at the back or probably the front of the front or back it doesn't really matter I think Creative Commons has some tips on where to put that where you got it what you revised uh, we revised you know chapters four and five uh, um, and added a, uh, additional assessments um, based on you know your teaching materials and then you can share that out. Now, if it's a work in progress, that's great, because if you then use it for this semester and you go, wow, OK, this didn't work. This assessment was like ridiculous, and I'm going to rework that assessment. If you rework that assessment and republish, I'm quoting my fingers, republish it, you can then share that additional version again with a reworked thing so that you're you're kind of creating that community of resharing as your as your creative work is being revised. And so because the internet is, you know, takes three clicks basically, um, and Eric's gonna share a little bit more about that, you can just continuously reshare because it's digital and it makes it really easy um, to reshare. So that's that's what I would say. Do you have a, a thought on that, Eric? Uh, yeah, so um, the kind of the, the ethos behind the share alike license is every time you have like a production version, something that you're going to use for something, when you have a usable version, that's you want to put that out there to everyone. Um, that's kind of what share alike is all about. So even if it's a work in progress, because you know every semester you're going to change it, um, every time you use it um, is an excellent time to put that version out. And um, actually, we'll get to scholar works in a bit. We do have a versioning capability. So, you know, even if you put out a first version and you, like, hate it um, by the next semester, you've changed everything around, um, we can put a new version on top of that without erasing it. So people can go back to that one, but they'll first see the latest version. Um, 
So you shouldn't be afraid of putting out um, works in progress because uh, your work is something that you hate may be wonderful for someone else. Um, and uh, all of these um, okay. are, are useful to educators everywhere. So my question is, um, do I post it at Creative Commons, or do I post it where I got it from, which is on the sailor.org slash books website? Um, because I went from Creative Commons to sailor.org, and that's where um, I got this, I think. I don't know. I was very deep <laughs> that way. Um, well, we'll get into how to provide proper attribution, but what you would probably want to do is you probably actually want to post it on ScholarWorks. And in the attribution, say this is a work based on this work from Sailor. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit in the second half of the talk. Um, okay, so what was the, where would I post it, you said? Um, at ScholarWorks at UA, and we will be at that uh, momentarily. Actually, yeah, oh, okay. yeah that's actually a great segue. Yeah, that's, perfect. Right. that's a great segue. I was, yeah, perfect, Darlene. Um, let me say something about the red arrows over here real quick. So um, we have, I've had other faculty to call at, with the same kind of question, what do the licenses mean? So I just want to be really clear in choosing a license, which Eric is going to go into here in just one second, they no derivatives over here with the ND. And, the, and the, these are not open education. Now, I have heard of one group, and I won't say who because they're still amazing, a little bit scared to put a full share on their works. And so their first go around with Creative Commons, they feel really strongly about no derivatives, which means they'll also choose very possibly a type of format that is not um, editable. So instead of posting on the ScholarWorks or um, wherever the other places they may post, they'll probably choose to do a PDF version, which we know nowadays Adobe 11 people can hack that. But um, there's a, there's ways around that too. But they're going to try to do something to to get their feet wet, which is you know sometimes okay. Hopefully they'll hope they'll start to be an understanding and discussion about what no derivatives means and how that's not really in the open community and move back over to the green um, on maybe a, a, an additional version um, of their work. So I just want to make sure that if you, and also if you see something that has the ND on it, that technically obviously means you guys can use this for free, but we don't want you to change anything because we really like it the way it is. And so they're just asking you not to change it, which isn't quite as strong as a copyright because you've gotten it for free, but it's like a copyright that says you can use it for free, but it's my work and I, I, want you, I don't want you to mess with it. So um, just to cover all of those licensing. And I think this is a perfect segue to go um, and have Eric share um, the repository itself and then how all of these things work together. So Eric, I'll hand it over to you. All right, um, and while you have the slide up, just a quick note about the interoperability of licenses. Um, so the best license to use for um, open educational resources is the CC BY, um, because you can use it with anything. And you still get your attribution. Um, we're, we're academics. We're very prestige driven. We want credit for what we did. Um, we have files and stuff like that, for which that is very important. Um, once you get into things like the license on the material that you're using, uh, the attribution non-commercial share alike, there are a lot of restrictions on what you can do with it. Like, if you wanted to just remix it and use it for your class and, um, you know, not really share it, um, you're technically out of compliance with that license because you're not sharing alike. You created something from it and you're not sharing it with the world. Um, whereas if someone felt a little bit sheepish about sharing alike, they're a work that they were creating on your thing. If they just attri provide attribution on a CC BY, you know, they could kind of sneak that in, try it a few semesters before they um, started resharing it. Um, the same problems you run into with non-commercial. Well, what if there's some people want print copies? Is that commercial or not? Um, so the more permissive license you can put on uh, an OER, the uh, easier it's going to be for people to reuse it. And, the what bigger impact it's going to have. Um, so uh, sharing 
my browser here. There's a great tool to be aware of for choosing that license. Um, can everyone see my browser? No, not yet. Okay. I see the share area, but I don't I don't see your browser. Okay. I'll give it a few seconds. Actually it I think it did something odd. Yeah, it's great sort of over. There you go. Okay. Uh -huh. I can see it now. It was on the wrong screen. There we go. Okay, so Creative Commons has a wonderful tool for choosing your license, and it's really important to get this right before we publish in ScholarWorks because Creative Commons licenses are irrevocable. So you want to make sure that, A, you have the right to assign the license you have because if you're using someone with a less permissive license, like non-commercial share alike, you can't put a, an attribution license on it. It has to be non-commercial share alike because it's a derivative of that work. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, there's a tool for that. Right here at the creativecommons.org site, there's a licenses drop down and choose a license. And this is a beautiful tool for not only choosing your license, but creating a little dongle to designate um, what the license on your work is and to know the information that you need to give people to uh, properly uh, attach metadata so people can find your thing online. Um, there's this little box here that has license features. And there's little radio buttons for everything you want people to be able to do with your work. The most permissive license is allow adaptations for your work to be shared. And then you get this attribution license over here in the right one. If you don't, this is a non-derivative license. Um, so if you don't want anyone to be able to modify your work, um, it's actually not great for open educational resources because at that point people can't change it. They can't make it theirs. They can't tailor it to their class. Um, this gives you the share alike license, and there's a toggle for commercial uses or not. And it will change the license over here. You can get to the plain text, easy to read summary of what you can do with the license by link. And it kind of lets you nail down exactly what you want people to be able to do. Um, and you can always go to a more restrictive license from a more permissive license, but you can't go from a restrictive license to you, you can always go um, from uh, Creative Commons attribution to something more restrictive, but you can't go from something more restrictive to attribution, which is why we, every, we always, in the open movement, like to encourage people to go with attribution only because it's the most widely reusable. Down here, there's a little wizard that can create um, HTML to label your work. And this is actually fantastic. I will actually be using it in ScholarWorks to create a widget for your work. Uh, but to do that right, uh, we need all this information. Here's the title of your work, um, your name, the creator, um, your work, and then the source work. If it's based on something, if, say, it's a revision of another thing, this is where that link to Sailor and uh, the document on sailor.org comes from, uh, goes. So having that information when you submit it to ScholarWorks is fantastic. Um, and these are uh, format things. So let's say I was publishing uh, the greatest textbook. Um, you can see it kind of creates the HTML and how it's going to display on a web page over here. Um, And all this information creates a dongle that um, we can use in ScholarWorks. And um, now that you're aware of this tool, we can go over to the repository itself. So ScholarWorks at UA is an open access institutional repository. Um, what it is is a place for creative works created by uh, University of Alaska faculty, staff, and students to live and be piped out to the world, which is a great fit for open educational resources um, because they're the sort of things that we want out there. Um, easily indexed, easily scanned, um, and usable by everyone. Um, so the URL is scholarworks.alaska.edu. And the contact from Learn More is me, um, UA Acquisitions, Eric Carlson. Um, so I'm the person to contact if you want to upload things to ScholarWorks at UA. And I handle most of the technical stuff. A little bit about what it, it does. So 
it's a big old digital server that has lots and lots of content. And it's content that is um, cataloged with metadata and piped out to all of the search engines in the world. Like it's in our discovery layer at the library. Google crawls it, Google Scholar, um, uh, Bayfield Academic Search Engine. Um, essentially, you name it, um, that search engine is indexing the site at a, very, at a very high authority, so it shows up very high in people's search results. Um, to kind of demonstrate that, uh, we have actually a free educational resource put out by the Japanese department called Monty's Bridge to Tomorrow, which is coming up here. So it's got a lot of information to tell the machines and people looking for it how to find it. And it's got all of the files showed up. So it's, you can attach multiple files to one record here to serve up to anyone who wants them. And if someone were just had heard about this book and wanted to learn about it, um, they'd go to Google like this. And type in, say, Monty's Bridge to Tomorrow. It comes up at the top of the results list. You click, it takes you to the record. Um, the same thing happens in discovery layers, uh, Google Scholar, um, Bayfield Academic Search. Um, so there are lots and lots of ways to give it this content. Um, going forward, as soon as we do the upgrade, there's also going to be um, a way to just have a search of things only with Creative Commons license in ScholarWorks. Uh, that should be coming next semester. And uh, Academic Innovations has also uh, been considering having a list of all uh, open educational resources on their site as well. Um, so you've chosen a license. You've decided you want to put it in ScholarWorks at UA. What do you need to do? Well, you need to decide what your file format is. Um, in your example, the file format uh, was a Microsoft Word document. That is a great choice for an open educational resource because it is easy for people to modify. They can just open up the Word document. They can rock and roll and start changing things. Um, it, whereas if it was a PDF, they have to do something to that before they can change it. But wait, you say. Uh, students don't. It's, the formatting in Word documents is kind of fuzzy. Not everyone has Word. Why can't I just put it out in a PDF for my students? The answer is yes, you can. Um, the best practice for uh, depositing open educational resources is actually to have the modifiable version, but also have an easily readable to everyone uh, PDF version, something that everyone can read on their computer right alongside it. Um, and it's very easy to do because, as we saw before, we can attach as many files to a record as we want. So, um, so you've chosen your license. You know all the things that you need to att um, provide attribution for. You have your files. Um, then all you need to do is email me. Eric Carlson um, at uh, the Consortium Library um, and say, hey, I have this open educational resource. I want to put it in ScholarWorks. Um, and you'll send me the files. And it'll be under a Creative Commons license, so we won't need to do anything with the rights because Creative Commons um, can, by its very nature, be shared. Um, and I will put it up in the repository, and it will be scanned by everything in the world. Um, and because it's under Creative Commons, anytime someone runs into it online, it'll smack you in the face with the license it's under right on the page, making it easier still for them to uh, discover what it is. All right. Um, and I kind of blew through that as fast as I could so we can get to your questions and your specific examples since you have uh, an open access textbook that you're looking at using. Um, so I think uh, we'll open it up to that. I was going to chat. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask Eric. Um, so, when um, we edit this this textbook, can we give it a new title, and um, and will it be posted in Creative Commons too? If it's posted in ScholarWorks, or is it just going to go into ScholarWorks, or do we post things to Creative Commons? I kind of didn't get that. So. Um, Creative Commons Search is um, 
a product they use to kind of uh, pull things from a lot of different places in a search. And ScholarWorks um, should uh, display correctly in Creative Commons search. I know that Cable said they are working on revamping that a lot, so it crawls everything better. Um, so a lot may be changing with the Creative Commons search in the near future. Um, but yes, it should show up in a Creative Commons search as well. They don't actually so much host the files as um, uh, crawl everyone else's crawl of the files. So the Creative Commons search on the site isn't um, a big repository. It's them like going out and scraping metadata from everyone else. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, I was actually under the misconception that Creative Commons was the repository. So um, that cleared that up for me. Thank you. No problem. I have a couple of questions that are probably, well, they're very first stage in all of this because I'm just kind of wrapping my head around. I didn't go to the workshops earlier. Um, I, I had a question around the licensing issue with respect to changing information. So my, I want my um, work out there. I like that idea. I like it to a broad audience. But my work also um, connects with people in different ways. So, um, so for example, I work with a lot with language awareness issues and um, um, varieties of, specifically with varieties of English. And so, for example, um, I talk about things like, you know, ain't is actually quite grammatical, things like that, um, which is true linguistically, but not true in a broad understanding of what grammar is. And my question is that there's enough um, folks out there who know a little but aren't experts in linguistics, right, that could modify my work to make it more um, myth-based instead of research-based. How does that work? So um, there, there are a couple things. Um, concerns about having your work misrepresented is why a lot of people use the really restrictive no derivative uh, license which is way better than all rights reserved, but not a truly open license, and it can create problems for people who want to modify work for curriculum purposes. Um, the other part is when people provide attribution to your work, they say that, that they, when they've modified it, they say this was based on work by someone. Um, but it, they don't say this is your um, end product. They say this is their end product that they've modified based on your product. Um, so if they're doing attribution correctly, they're not um, they're not saying that you wrote what they wrote. They're saying that they took what you wrote and they changed it, and it's it's something that they made based on what you did. Uh, so it's kind of um, a modified piece of curriculum. It's almost attribution is like a citation um, rather than a this is this person's baby. This is their end product. They have total editorial control. Um, so. Does that uh, make sense? It kind of does. I mean, I still, um, there's still a potential. Um, I mean, I, I I understand the licensing, and, and I, I would prefer to have, you know, open, completely open access. Right. I right. prefer not to have the, the stronger licensing. But there is a real danger in misrepresentation of information where um, that is perpetuated. I mean, it happens in regular academic spaces too, right? Somebody cites a site from um, a paper that was cited in the paper that was cited in the paper incorrectly, right? And that right. then becomes the lore because nobody ever goes back to the original resource. But here you've got a different, even a larger population that could misinterpret work. So I'm I'm hesitant <laughs> on that a little bit, but I understand, um, so I'm back and forth. I'd rather not have a restrictive license, but um, it does worry me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and that is a, a very real risk. You have to kind of weigh impact and distribution against um, 
reputational fears, um, which I think is actually a, a risk for everyone, regardless of whether you're on a, under a Creative Commons license. The more, the bigger a, a, an impact you have on the field, the, the bigger your effect, uh, the bigger your influence, mm -hmm. the more people like more people are using stuff, the more likely it is that someone misuses or misrepresents represents what you do. Um, and I think that, I mean, I, I'm a brand new assistant professor, so I don't have a whole lot of reputation to lose. But uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I feel like that's kind of part of the, the risk of playing the game. And it, yeah. the more you're contributing to the body of knowledge, whether it be curriculum or uh, scholarly articles or anything, um, the more likely it is someone's going to misuse your work, but that's not on you, that's on them. Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm less concerned, in fact, I'm not at all concerned about my own reputation in that, actually. I'm more concerned about misinformation, um, because the right. whole reason of putting on Creative Commons would be to share um, established research. Um, so that's my whole issue. Um, not reflected on me, but misinformation in general. Right, yeah. And, and that is, you know, that's that's a risk when you say that someone can modify your material. There's, no one has found a good way to legally write down, only people who know what they're talking about can modify my material, unfortunately. Um, it, it's either, yes or, uh, the way you do that is you actually have a restrictive license and then you explicitly give permission to scholars on a, per scholar basis to, to modify, which kind of has a chilling effect mm -hmm. on uh, distribution and reuse. So one more quick, yeah, one more quick question, and then I'll quit taking up everybody's time, but it, re it relates oh, no, to good. the licensing. Um, who, who's monitoring this licensing, right? Who's to say that something is being utilized appropriate? Does, the, does ScholarWorks, for example, track usage and who's used what when? Um, no, uh, ScholarWorks does track like basic usage, usage statues, stats, bleh, excuse me, bleh. basic usage stats, so like how many times a thing is used and kind of what locales the usage is coming from, but we don't like track individual usages because to do that we'd have to uh, be very invasive uh, about uh, looking at people who access our site in ways that are not consistent with our values. Um, it would, uh, and it, so, um, with regards to Creative Commons in general, um, this is just a license. This isn't an enforcement framework. Um, the enforcement framework is the courts. Um, and the places where Creative Commons licensing has been upheld is when someone who is creates content and then someone uses it in a way that's inconsistent with the license. You know, if they're upset enough about that, they go to court and they get um, restitution in whatever way is appropriate in their country because it is, I think it's good in, I don't want to give the wrong num but number, but 194 countries or something like that. Uh, mm. So, um, For example, a, a late in Germany uh, took a picture of a, a protest and licensed it under Creative Commons attribution and put it up on Flickr. And uh, Der Spiegel took it and put it on the front page and didn't cite her. Uh, oh. he, she, in turn, uh, took them to court and got the maximum damages and, uh, from them in small claims court. It was like a thousand bucks um, in, in Deutschmarks at the time uh, because they hadn't cited her. And the judge, basically she went in, she says, it's clearly licensed. Here's the license. They didn't do what it says. And after I notified them, they still didn't post a correction and cite and say it was me. So she took them to court. The judge read the license and says, no, you have to post correction and say it was her and the award the damages up to how much do you want, lady? And she cited the maximum amount. So uh, the enforcement on this is just like any other intellectual property claim. You do have to take people to court. I mean, there's there's a nice thing like saying, hey, you're using that wrong. Please cite me correctly, which most of the time if you say that to someone, they're like, oh, my bad. Um, but when it has, the rubber does meet the road, it is the courts that enforce, enforces this because this is a license that leans on copyright law in whatever country you have to be, uh, happen to be in. Thank you. That helps. Um, and in, earlier, Eric said that uh, Creative Commons is working on their search engine. And Cable Green also mentioned, because someone else asked a question, that very similar question about who 
you know, how do we know who's using it and all that? And they, in their pro development process, are also looking at how to use that metadata. So if we, if we as publishers use their tool here and we embed their license using their, their tool and their metadata, it'll be easier for them to gather that information from the internet. Now, saying that's easy is really not for us easy, but they've got a million amazing people that are working on this worldwide, so hopefully they'll figure that out. <laughs> so, um, but he did mention that that's something that they want to, to look into so that there is um, a, an easy way for users to, to look out there and see, you know, maybe where, they are pu pu where your works have been reshared, where your works are being used based on, you know, where they're posted. Um, you know, out there in the world, because we are encouraging faculty to post at ScholarWorks. One, because it brings fac it brings people to our ScholarWorks, right? It brings them to UAA. That's really good for us. We're affiliated with UAA. We could post at Merlot, or we could post at all these different places. But ScholarWorks for us um, is is a really great way to get to do that start. We don't have to post it on other people's sites that you know, aren't affiliated with UAA, and because of the way ScholarWorks works that Eric just explained, it also makes it, what like Claire said, it broadens the audience. It's, it's Googleable, <laughs> right? People can mm -hmm. Google that your content or keywords in your content and find it, and that's, that makes it even more amazing. You don't have to do any of that back-end work um, because it's all built into the system that Eric is, is uh, uh, administrating for us. And then the last part of that I was going to say is, um, it gives us that opportunity to do all the things that both of you had said. And Darlene, you asked a question up here earlier. This, um, you must use the same license as the originator used. And I think that you, um, when you're redistributing and you go through the CC license tool that we just used, I think that that, mach that, that little generator actually assists you in making sure you have the correct license as the originator because you put in their website information, right, Eric? Is that um, true? I actually don't know that it is that advanced. I think um, it, Let's try. Permissions, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll try one. Yeah. So, um, I, so that prompts another question. Um, <clears throat> so at the bottom of the current resource I plan to use, is the the sailor.org um, license, right? So when I repost, do I leave that in place and then put put the my license or the that license on top of it, um, or help, or do I just generate one and put it on the new in the new file, the new content? Okay, so. I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, yours was a share-like non-commercial from... Yes. So you are pretty much locked into doing a share-like non-commercial when you're doing a derivative work of a share-like non-commercial license because it is so restrictive. Uh, so if you're making a derivative work of that work, that's the license you're, you're going to use. Okay. Um, if something is under a more permissive license, you can lock it down more, but you can't kind of open up a lockdown license, which is a great example of why we encourage people to use as permissive a license as possible. Uh, because with that particular textbook, it has to be non-commercial use and it has to be shared alike, um, even right. if you're remixing it, because you're using content from that initial uh, work. Yeah, but which isn't bad though, um, because it's in academia. We'll t say you know it's they're just trying to make sure that maybe um, a department's not pulling together, remixing, and then charging their students for the content of the book. I mean, we might they might get charged to print it off, but they won't be necessarily charged um, for the content of the book. And so right. I think that's why they have non-commercial on there. Uh, because it's so focused on educational, you know, content and built for teaching from a classroom, right? right. So, so I think that's why they put them on there. Um, we did, uh, Dave over here did a quick search on um, 
on some OER content. He goes, oh, look, someone downloaded that and put a different title on it, and they're trying to sell it on um, Amazon. And I was like, well, that's funny, because if you Google that same title, you'll get the free one first. <laughs> so I mean, people, you know, maybe are out there trying to, to use it incorrectly, but um, I think that for the most part in our community, you're going to see that people are using them correctly because they want to be part of the community um, of open ed resources. So it, it, you're always going to have someone, I don't know where that person was from, you know, it's probably the same kind of people who send us the emails that say, send me $425.82 and I will transfer $8 million to your account, to your bank account if you give me your bank account number. So, you know, there's going to be people on the fringes that are doing stuff like that. But I think for the core of us, as education professionals and people in higher ed, and even K-12 right now, um, there's a big movement that this this is there in a community of people who want to share and want to do it correctly. So, so I think we're in good company. Um, I loved your guys' questions. Uh, I am so excited about what um, we can do at UAA and, and how projects are moving forward. So I just wanted to do um, a real quick last, we can stay on a little bit um, if you have a couple additional questions, but I wanted to give you this resources list. I gave you the ScholarWorks um, address. Did I get that right? It's UAA Alaska EDU or is it Alaska? It's Alaska, right? Um, Alaska.edu. Alaska.edu. Okay, and then the Creative Commons, of course, we were there. But also, um, and I don't know if you can copy and paste this one, but the LibGuides, um, the RC Hutchings, who's one of our uh, librarians, uh, just, what is she? She's a distance education, no, she's the instructional design librarian, I think. Um, don't, it's recorded, right? So don't let her know. I'm not sure what her title is, but she's amazing. So we'll say that again. And she's amazing. She created a LibGuide about OER, and it's a little bit of a work in progress because we started with, um, you know, how to find content. And so we've got a lot of links uh, out there to things like you found Darlene the Sailor um, content. Um, uh, sailor.org and other places that you can look for content for your your uh, information. But also, um, we are, that's again a work in progress and we're l looking at adding another tab that says how to publish your own um, or how to publish your remixed and reused works. So the information that we are talking about now, uh, we're gathering and curating so that we've got some good instruction sets and like Eric's contact information and that kind of thing. Um, for faculty. So in your talks and discussions about OER with your departments and your um, peers, please um, make sure you share that that guide exists. If you go to the consortium website, are you going to go there? Um, and go to the LibGuides page, you can just search OER, the letters, and, and her LibGuide will pop up there. Um, and it's got a lot of really great info. So I just want to make sure we leave with resources so you've got things, more things to look at. And then the last bit is, like Eric said, he is the contact for the scholar works. Um, you've got something to publish and, and you, what do we do now? Um, and we also have instructional designers here at AINE if you are needing someone to talk out a project with or to do research with, um, we are definitely here uh, and we can um, hook up with you and start talking things out. But also DRC Hutchings and Lorelei Sterling with the library, um, they also are um, the two if you're looking for assistance with looking for content that um, in your in your area or or to you know look to reuse or revise or remix, and they they're kind of in our they're in our OER team. And the last last thing is there's also an on the UAA Commons site there's an OER group if you haven't yet joined to that we're trying to encourage to people to go to and talk about their projects or ask questions um, about what other people are doing or if you found find yourself in a in a place um, that that you feel like you're stuck or need some need someone to sit and with co have coffee with and talk out. Uh, we was trying to create this OER community um, across campus. So I really appreciate um, everybody's input, and I'm glad you two are here. You have the greatest questions. Do you have any more questions today before we kind of sign off? No, I'm good. Thank you. No, I have none. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. 
again, thank you, Eric, for teaming up with me on this. You're a very integral part of our faculty um, being able to know where to go to post their published and remixed degrees work. I really appreciate um, the work that you do. And I am going to stop the recording and say goodbye for now. <laughs>